Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Elon Yugev. This is a joint work with uh, Moni Noor. And the title is Bloom Filters in Adversarial Environments. So um, there is a long-standing connection between uh, cryptography and data structures. And I want to show you one example through a data structure that's called a Bloom Filter. So what is a Bloom Filter? So there is some large universe U. U is some large universe of elements. Think of all possible URLs in the internet. And we're interested in some subset S of size n. And the goal is for any element to answer, is this element inside the set? And we want the data structure. So it's a very practical data structure. So we want to be very fast. OK, so the query time should be like really constant time. And even more importantly, we want the representation OK, the memory used by this data structure to be very small. In particular, we want it to be much, much smaller than what you actually need to represent the set S. So how can we do that? Of course, we allow errors. So this is going to be a probabilistic data structure, and we're going to have some probability of error. This notion was introduced by Bloom, by Bloom in 1970, and he gave a specific a nice construction but I'm going to refer to any solution to this problem as a Bloom filter. And for simplicity for this talk, let's just think as the whole set given in advance, and then we're giving the queries. So how do I define a Bloom filter? So uh, an epsilon Bloom filter is a pair of algorithms, P and Q. P is going to be the pre-processing algorithm, and Q is the query algorithm. And we have the following definition. So we run the pre-processing algorithm okay, on the set S, and we get uh, a memory representation M. Okay? So M is going to be this representation of the set S. And then we have uh, two, two requirements. The first one is that for any element of the set, we have that the probability that the query algorithm with this representation inside on this uh, element X just answers yes. Okay? So we have no mistakes here. This happens with probability one. On the other hand, for any element not in the set, we require that he mistakes, so he answers yes with probability at most epsilon. And the, probabil the probabilities here are taking over the preprocessing algorithm P. And there's uh, several constructions. Uh, so the memory, I define it by little m. So to achieve a, a n epsilon Bloom filter, you can. Uh, you use uh, n log 1 over epsilon bits. And so this is uh, tight. It's upper bound and a lower bound. And this data structure has uh, various applications in many areas. OK, and it's practically used in Google Chrome and Facebook and other and networking databases, many, many places. And I want to uh, specify one common place where it's used by. OK? One place is like. Uh, representing the, the content of the cache. OK, so suppose we have a web proxy that uh, fetches uh, pages from the internet and it has some cache. And we have a user. The user requests some element. And the web proxy first wants to check if he has this web page in the, in the cache. And if not, it goes to the internet. And going to the disk is very slow. It's a, it's a disk query. So what we do, we represent the elements in the cache in a Bloom filter that takes a small amount of memory in the memory. Uh, OK. So the web proxy first checks the Bloom filter to see if he has it in the, in the cache. If the Bloom filter says no, it just goes straight to the internet. And if he says yes, then only we go to the disk. A mistake, or what's called a false positive by the Bloom filter, means he'll say yes, and the web proxy will go to the disk and then see that actually it doesn't have uh, this page. But this will happen only once in a while, not every query. OK, so now let's go back. This was a Bloom filter, the classic definition you'll find in the literature. Now let's go back to the definition and try to look at it from a crypto cryptographic point of view. So this is what was like our security definition, OK, the error probability at most epsilon. And the question is, what happened when, when the user can do many queries and he see the responsive of his queries? OK, so you see the responses, and then he can do more queries. He does them adaptively. 
Uh, this could happen in many cases. For example, here, uh, let's say he measures the response time from the server. So if he measures the response time, he could know if the bloom filter said yes or no, and if he went to the disk or went straight to the internet. This is just one example. Um, and the question that arises, what can a user do? Can he increase the false positive by doing the sequence of adaptive queries? So let's try to formalize this a bit. And what I want to do is take the original definition of the bloom filter and draw it as a game as we uh, do in cryptography in many cases. Okay, so how do I draw the original, original definition of a bloom filter as a game? So I have on one side an adversary, on the other side a challenger. And the original definition says that it must hold for any S, so we think of S as adversarially chosen. So the adversary chooses, chooses S, sends it to the challenger. The challenger computes, preprocesses S and computes M. Then the adversary picks any element X and the challenger computes Y, which is the query with this representation M on X. Okay, and we define that, we say that the adversary wins if Y equals one, okay, so he found a false positive, and X is not in the set S. Okay, of course, if X is in the set S, the answer would be one. So this is the definition if the adversary wins, and the security says that uh, the probability the adversary wins is at most epsilon. Okay, so this is just rewriting the original definition of the Bloom filter as a game. And now maybe it's more easy to see what's the problem uh, with this definition. Okay, for starters, all the arrows go to one side. Okay, it's a bit of a boring game. The adversary sees, ha doesn't get any information back. So let's try to give him more information, try to simulate the definitions we know uh, from encryption, where the adversary can play with the system first and only at the end he, he provides a challenge. Okay, so let's send Y back to the adversary. So now we're sending the, the response back to the adversary. And we're not gonna do it once. This whole process, we're gonna do many times. So now each X becomes XI and the Y, YI. At and the end, when the adversary is done, he's gonna send X star. Okay, this is the challenge that he sends. And then we're gonna compute Y star, which is the query of M of X star. And now we're gonna say that the adversary wins if Y star equals one, and X star is not in the set S, and of course, none of the previous uh, queries that, it, that he did before. So no, none of the X size. And the security stays the same. We say that the probability that A wins is the most epsilon. Okay, so now we have a new definition of security for a Bloom filter. Of course, now we can talk about the computational power of the adversary. So let's assume for a start that the computational power, if I don't say anything, I assume the computational power of the adversary is polynomially bounded. And so we get a new definition which we call an adversarial resilient Bloom filter. Okay, and if, if we have a data structure that follows this definition, and then we say that it's an N epsilon strong adversarial resilient Bloom filter. Strong because we didn't limit the amount of queries that he can do. And if we limit the amount of queries to T, then we say that we have a N epsilon, oops, N epsilon T adversarial resilient bloom filter. Okay, so what are our contributions? So the first one is defining adversarial resilient bloom filter, which we did. The second contribution is a general transformation. So we take any bloom filter and make it adversarial resilient. And we use PRPs, pseudo random permutations, and we also give concrete implementation, which I might talk about later. Then we show that actually one way functions are necessary. Okay, we'll see that later, even for what we call the unsteady presentation case. And at the end, I'll talk about unbounded adversaries where we also give a construction. So let's start with the first theorem, uh, a transformation from any standard blue filter to adversarial resilient blue filter. So what about the parameters? So we start with an N epsilon bloom filter with memory M. 
And we result with an N epsilon Bloom filter that uses memory M plus lambda. What is this lambda? So our tools are the pseudo random permutation. And so lambda is just the security parameter, actually just additional key to the pseudo random permutation. Okay, and why does, okay, how does the, the uh, transformation work? It's very simple, you just start with any standard Bloom filter and you just apply a, a PRP to the queries before you send them to the Bloom filter. And why is this okay? Well, actually what you're doing, you're just really randomizing the adversary's queries. Okay, so the, the queries he made after the PRP are just indistinguishable from random. And then he really doesn't have any advantage of playing in this game and doing the queries adaptively. He might as well just choose them at random to the begin with, and then the standard Bloom filter security holds. Okay, great. So this is a simple construction. Now some of you might be a bit concerned. Why? I took a data structure called a Bloom filter that we use every day, and it exists. Okay, we, it's constructed from simple uh, pairwise hash functions, stuff like that. And I changed the definition a bit. Yeah, we're all uh, okay with that. But now I, I have a new uh, construction with, that uses PRPs, this uh, heavy machinery that we don't really know if exists, and stuff like that. So, so what's the deal? So our next theorem shows that actually any uh, adversarial resilient Bloom filter must use one-way functions, okay, which are equivalent to PRPs. And what I mean by non-trivial, well, one way of constructing adversarial resilient Bloom filter is by just storing the set as precisely. Okay, if you just store the set as precisely, then you have no errors at all, and the adversary really has no advantage. Uh, so non-trivial, I mean any Bloom filter just uses slightly less uh, memory than what you need to, to hold the set, and some errors occur somewhere. Okay, so the existence of one-way functions equivalent to the existence of PRFs and uh, in turn PRPs. Um, okay, so let's see for a second how a uh, recipe of this proof works. Okay, so what do we want to prove? We want to prove the counterpositive that if we don't have one-way functions, we can really attack any Bloom filter. So no Bloom filter is adversarial resilient. Okay, so we need to construct an attacking algorithm. So how do we do it? Okay, you give me some Bloom filter, we're gonna do the following. We sample some random x1 to xt, okay, and query them, and we'll get results y1 to yt. Okay, so now I have these x's, and they're like labels, y1 to yt. This is like samples, and I have the label. So now I'm gonna try to somehow learn some representation M prime. M prime is not gonna be exactly M, but it's gonna be in some sense very similar to M. Then I'm gonna find some X star that according to M prime is a false positive. And this I can do because I have M prime, so I can simulate, okay? I don't really have to perform these queries. And then we have to prove that since X star is a false positive relative to M prime, it's also gonna be a false positive relative to M. So the first two steps are done using a machinery from a learning theory. So actually we model this problem as a pack learning problem and X1 and XT are our samples and really the, the task is to efficiently find a consistent hypothesis, okay, since once I have m, qm is just a Boolean function. So I'm really trying to learn this Boolean function that is unknown. And the algorithm needs to run in polynomial time, so I need to find a consistent hypothesis in polynomial time. But remember that one-way functions do not exist. And here I use the fact that I convert any function to quickly find a consistent hypothesis. And the number of queries I need here is gonna be O of m over epsilon. Okay, so what you can see by this is more or less I need to learn the bits of m. There's m bits of memory, and it takes me about one over epsilon queries to learn each bit of the memory. Um, and then we're gonna find x star, uh, that's a false positive relative to m prime, and since q of m prime 
and Q of M are going to be very similar as Boolean functions with very high probability X star is going to be a false positive for the real representation M. Okay, so this concludes the overview of the proof of this theorem. Okay, so you have to use one-way functions according to construct adversarial resilient Bloom filter. Now we ask what happens if we change the setting a bit, okay? And we want to give Q uh, more power. So what, ca what power can we give Q? So first, let's, let, let, uh, we'll let Q be randomized, okay? So now the, the query algorithm can be randomized, and this means that he can like, add noise to the answers. Even though he knows that the answer is no, maybe with some small probability, he's going he's gonna to say yes. And now the task before of learning it becomes the task of learning something with errors, which is, in general, a much harder task. And let's even give him more power. Why not have Q change the underlying representation after each query? So he, he gets a query, maybe add noise, and then maybe he rehashes some stuff, maybe he chooses new random variables. Okay, can change the other underlying representation. And now we're trying to uh, learn something that changes even, so it's even more harder. And one could hope maybe to incorporate some differential private uh, algorithm or stuff like that to get rid of the use of the need of one-way functions. I want to give one example of, of uh, such a Bloom filter, okay, that has an unsteady representation. Think of one that has two Bloom filters, Bloom filter one and two. They're both initialized with the same set S, and for the first 100 queries, I only use the first one, okay? And then after 100 queries, I throw the first one away and only use the second one, okay? So really for the first 100 queries, I learned nothing about the second Bloom filter. So the algorithm from before, okay, if T is known in advance, then it can never work. It, it, it uh, eliminates any attack algorithm that uses a pre a number of queries that is pretty fine from advance, okay? Because I'll just make this uh, Bloom filter uh, exactly after T queries, throw it away, and use a, a totally fresh one. Nevertheless, our third result is we show that the previous uh, theorem, okay, that you have to use one-way functions to construct uh, adversarial Bloom filters hold even for the unsteady case. Okay, so this additional power really doesn't give you more power. And let's see what happens to this recipe in general. So the first two steps was before learning a, a, a function, an unknown function, then we used PAC, we modeled it as a PAC, PAC learning problem. Here we're not learning a function anymore, we're learning a distribution, okay, because Q is randomized. And moreover, this distribution might change after each query that we do. So this is an adaptively changing distribution. So we use a result by an old Rothblum, and they define this framework of adaptively changing distributions, and they have some results there. And we're going to we use not exactly their algorithm. We modify it a bit, but we use essentially their algorithm for learning such distributions. Under the, under the assumption that one-way functions do not exist. And for technical reasons, the number of queries add from m over epsilon to m over epsilon squared. And then this other part also becomes much harder, since now we don't, our, our guarantee of the, of the similarity is only that these two distributions are close in statistical distance, and so these steps become also much harder. But essentially, this captures uh, the proof uh, for the unsteady case. Uh, what about unmounted adversaries? So now I'm talking about constructions, OK? Uh, since any unbounded adversary, of course, can in, uh, invert any one-way functions. So we cannot expect to construct a strong uh, adversarial resilient Bloom filter. But still, we can expect to construct something that's resilient to T queries, okay? And here we have a result saying that for any epsilon and T, there exists the N epsilon T resilient Bloom filter. So this is a Bloom filter that is resilient for T queries. And the question is, how much memory do you need to put for each query, okay? So the memory is gonna be 
and log one over epsilon. This is the basic what is required for any Bloom filter, even with the classical definition. And we have plus t. This is the additional memory we need uh, to be resent for t queries, okay? I notice that here, there's like an assumption that the adversary really what happens, he learns one bit or a constant number of bits uh, per query, okay? Where if you take our, our theorem from before as a lower bound, okay, in this case, can, since we can invert any function, what we had before that we learned only, uh, uh, we learned one bit of memory, uh, only each one of our epsilon queries, okay? So here we learned one bit each one of our epsilon queries, and so we still have a gap, and um, this is an uh, open problem. I think it's interesting to, clo to close, because uh, when you get into it, you really get to the specifics of uh, the problem. Uh, the construction of this is very non-trivial, using a lot of um, interesting hash functions. And the last thing I want to say is, is, say is about implementation. So we gave an excuse why we use pseudorandom permutations, a theoretical one since we showed that you have to use one-way functions or pseudorandom permutations. Nevertheless, we gave an implementation. This implementation uses AES instructions that are really built in, in many more, almost all modern CPUs. And the result is what we get is that you can have an implementation of a Bloom filter that in one hand is secure, okay, up to the security of AES, and on the other hand runs really as fast as any other implementation that I could find on the internet. Um, okay, thank you.